Good morning. For the prelude, good morning. For the prelude, we have Why the King of Love is Dead by Nina Simone's bassist. The song was written just days after the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King. So as Alan and I perform this, I really do encourage you, go watch Nina Simone's version on YouTube when you get the chance. It is, it is something. Once upon this planet Earth lived a man of humble birth, preaching love and freedom for his fellow man. He was dreaming of a day Peace would come to earth to stay And he spread this message all across the land Turn the other cheek, he pleaded Love thy neighbor was his creed Pain, humiliation, death He did not dread With his Bible at his side From his foes he did not hide It's hard to think that this great man is dead Will the murders never cease Are they men or are they beasts What do they think What do they ever hope to gain Will my country fall, stand or fall? Is it too late for a soul? And did Martin Luther King just die in vain? Cause he'd seen the mountain top And he knew he couldn't stop Always living with the threat of death ahead. Folks, you better stop and think Cause we're Headed for the brink. What will happen now? That is dead. He was for equality for all people, you and me. Full of love and goodwill, hate was not his way. He was not a violent man. Oh, tell me, folks, oh, if you can, just why? How was he shot down the other day? Well, he'd 
see the mountaintop And he knew he couldn't stop Always living with the threat of death ahead Folks, you better stop and think and feel again How we're heading for the brink What will happen Now that the king of love is dead We're lucky to have you. Thank you, both. <clears throat> well, quite a day. Good morning. I am Chris Brubaker, at least I think I am, today's worship associate, that I know. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Lancaster on this day before Martin Luther King Jr. Day. However, Dr. King was born 94 years ago on this day, uh, January 15th. So it really is a special day. Uh, here we come together to nourish the spirit, connect in love, and act in justice. We welcome you this morning just as you are. How refreshing. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, however you identify, today you are part of this spiritual community. And if this is your first time, may you soon discover this is also your spiritual community. And now I have a different announcement. Don't worry, nothing's gonna happen now. Just think about it. Toward the end of the service, when Ray comes forward and makes uh, instructions for you, we will be co conducting a practice evacuation drill. If we had an actual evacuation drill, our usual meeting place will be the Emanuel Lutheran Church at the corner of Prince Pine and Walnut Street. We are hoping when people are directed by Ray to exit for the drill, and there's three ways to go, one, two, three, um, you will you know, exit uh, and you will walk to the church and then walk back, which is approximately one block. However, please understand there are people here that have issues that they need to have special consideration for and we're, we will accommodate that, not to worry. For the drill, those of you who have children now who will be with, not with you when it happens, um, they will be directed by the um, faith development people upstairs, and you will be also directed as their parents to pick them up outside, which is what we would normally do in the case of an, evac an actual eva eva evacuation. Um, you will receive more instructions at the end of this service and prior to the drill. And now the more fun part. As has become our custom, let us give a special welcome to all of us who are joining this ser morning service on Zoom. And that's our camera. I invite you on Zoom to turn on your camera, da -da -da -da, and share a wave together. Could be one hand or two hands. Woo -woo. To everyone in the sanctuary, let us wave to the camera our greetings. I hope you guys up there in the Zoom room got it. During our time together, please do what you need to do to feel fully present in this space. Move, sway, walk around. If doing something with your hands help you to feel present, please feel free to use the handouts on materials in the tables back in the women's memorial room. And now at this time, it is my pleasure to welcome Darcy Pollock, a member of the Board of Trustees, 
Here she comes to say a word. Thank you. Good morning. I also welcome all this morning. And just to, not just to this space and time, but let us acknowledge in this sacred space the truth of the land beneath and around us. We are gathered on land once inhabited by people known as the Susquehannock and Conestoga. We acknowledge the violent legacies of genocide, displacement, and settlement that led us to being here today and remind ourselves to live humbly in relation with this land and with all the indigenous peoples still living and loving on this continent. Many indigenous peoples will say, all are relatives. May we live into this truth and aspiration together. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our minister, the Reverend Patricia Gutman Harish. Thank you, Darcy and Chris. Hi, I'm Pat. I'm Reverend Patricia Guthman Haresh, the minister here, one of the ministers, actually, because we have affiliated community ministers as well. And for me, um, I was seven and a half when Martin Luther King was killed. And it has such an impression on my heart. And um, it's, it's a really sad day for me. Um, even though I also want to celebrate the words and the wisdom and the work inspired by uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I can't believe that he would be 94 today because all we can think of is that beautiful young man in his early 30s, right? Forever, forever. And um, amazingly so, we can also think of his legacies and his children. And now that little granddaughter of his um, who's been an activist and has been publicly speaking. Uh, we'll remember his words, the civil rights movement. And the unfortunate thing is how so many of his words still ring true and speak to us today when I think men of, many of us thought would be beyond that by now, all these many years later. Uh, as we light our chalice, I'm gonna read words from a friend and colleague, um, uh, Reverend Audette Fulbright Fusen, and these are words that specifically honored uh, Dr. King. It is not enough to march and remember. The work we are called to do is to feed hungry children and to wipe the tears from our siblings' eyes. It is not enough to sing a joyful song. We must also build the houses that will give shelter to every adult and child and allow them full security and dignity. We are called to remember that we are not to judge one another by the color of our skins, but by the content of our character. We know that racism still lurks like a viper around unexpected corners. And so we gather again to renew our promise to one another that we will be vigilant. Let us not forget that the mantle Dr. King wore for a time has been passed now to us, to each of us here gathered. In a spirit of remembrance, gratitude, and hope, we set forth once again to make the world anew. And so let us sing. And if you're able in body, spirit to rise, and Eli will lead us in singing, Be That Guide, number 124 in the Gray Hymnal. Thank you, Eli. And we'll sing all four, four verses. whom love sustains rise above the daily strife lift on high the 
time in the service that uh, those who are children in age or spirit are welcome to come on up and join me. Really anyone of any age can join me. Um, and we're going to share along the lines of the theme today, I think, but we will not know until we open the Wonder Box what exactly we're going to talk about. I wonder, would anyone be able to open up the wonder, wonder box and see what's inside? Does anyone want to do that? Help me open up? Flynn, would you like to help me? Or do you want to bring your helper with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's inside? What do we see in there? Oh, what's that? Wow. Oh, it's a picture. I think it's a picture. Thank you, Flynn. It says this is Melanie Damore. Melanie Damore. Would anyone like to hold on to this picture? You're welcome to. I, would you like to hold it? No. I can put it right here. So you can see. Well, I'll put her here so you can keep an eye. She goes by the pronouns she, but also they and them. Melanie Damore. And Melanie Damore is someone who's familiar to a lot of Unitarian Universalists and many others. She calls herself and themselves a vocal activist, a vocal activist. Living in Oakland, California, that's where they're centered, but the music can be heard many places. Eli is going to, in a little bit, teach us a song by Melanie and if you came earlier in the fall, if you had come to that evening power interfaith event downtown, you would have heard me lead, <laughs> trying to lead the crowd. Thank you so much from the music therapist. You would have heard me try to lead the crowd in the song we're going to teach everybody today. And, um, but I want to tie it into today's theme. Did anyone remember the the person we said who, who we're thinking of today and the reason why some are going to be off of school tomorrow, I think. Tomorrow is a big day. Does anyone remember the name of the man? Yes. Columbus Day. It's not Columbus Day. It's quite different, <laughs> actually. Quite different. But we celebrated Indigenous Day, Columbus Day, earlier. It is somebody's birthday today. Any? Flynn, you are correct. Martin Luther King. Today would have been his birthday, but the whole country is going to celebrate tomorrow, Martin Luther King Day. And why might we sing? Why might we sing when we're thinking 
of Martin Luther King Day. I mean, anyone think of why we might sing on Martin Luther King Day? I know when I was little, whenever they would, he very much worked for civil rights, which is really the respect and the dignity of every person. And he worked for the poor, and he gathered people together to march in protest for really the care of everybody. And oftentimes when we get together, you know, it's one thing to just uh, shout out and say in a, in a microphone what we think, but to be able to sing together and in song march and bring our message, it really can be more powerful. And I'm a minister saying that, and you pay me to talk, but I really understand how powerful it is to sing together and spread our message that way. Um, and so many of us associate the songs of the, of the civil rights movement with the whole thing that Martin Luther King stood for. Melanie Damore writes music in that spirit and in honor of that movement. So uh, their song is actually a new song related to civil rights. And everything they do is about inspiring children and adults about the power of song for social and political change and good. So as, Eli's going to teach us the song, and, and then we'll send you out to go to your program. Um, or you can stay with your parents, I'm not sure, and the people who brought you, I'm not sure what your plan is. Alan's going to help me a little bit with the percussion, but to get started... You gotta put one foot in front of the other And lead with love Put one foot in front of the other And lead with love Again, ready? Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love Put one foot in front of the other And lead with love Don't give up hope Don't give up hope You're not alone You're not alone Don't you give up Don't you give up Keep moving on you gotta put one foot in front of the other And lead with love Put one foot in front of the other And lead with love You gotta put one foot in front of the other And lead with love Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love Lift up your eyes Don't you despair Look up ahead The path is there You gotta put one foot in front of the other And lead with love Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Oh, put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. I know you're scared, and I'm scared too. But here I am, right next to you. You gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. Put one foot in front of the other and lead with love. One more time, you gotta put one foot in front of the other and lead with love oh put one foot in front of the other and lead with love 
Well, it sounded great. <laughs> well, I think that song helped us go right to our center, yes. The center, which is our heart. And this is the time we focus on that place, which is really where everything begins, I think. I'm going to share a Sabbath meditation uh, from Reverend Leif Seligman. And she has both a background, not, she is a Unitarian Universalist minister, but she has both a Jewish background and a, a Buddhist sensibility. And I think you'll hear that in this meditation. We pause in the stillness to rest for a moment, to quiet ourselves so that we can feel what stirs within us. Each breath draws us closer to the pulse of life. And with each escalation, we make room for something new. May we find in this gathering the comfort of those that care. May we encounter patience along our growing edges and compassion in our most tender spots. Here may we find the inspiration and encouragement we need to face our challenges and nurture ourselves. And in the presence of suffering across the globe, may we redouble our efforts to practice kindness right where we are, with the hope that the light of our actions travels like the light of faraway stars. May it be so. And I think of that when we plant a stone in the sand, which we will do soon, I think of that Often I say it's like planting roots in the ground and may those roots spread. May we also think of it when we plant that stone, may our intention and love and hopes travel out in the words of, of Leaf, travels like the light of faraway stars. And so, uh, Chris, while I um, will help me, I'm going to name out loud some joys and sorrows and complex truths. And while I do, uh, Chris will plant some stones. And then I'll invite you to come as you wish and plant stones as well. Um, in, in silence, though, we may have some music in the background as we do. Um, I realized last week I had a long list of people uh, who had been hospitalized over the uh, holidays or were sick or were coming up on surgeries and whatever. It's still a long list. So I'm just going to say maybe a bunch of stones of concern for all those who have been sick with those horrible colds and viruses all of those who've um, been in the hospital, thank goodness they're back, and those who then went to the hospital, had surgeries, we have a bunch of stones. It's that time of the year. It's just kind of that time of the year. Um, I do want to hold up um, Kim, uh, Kim of one of our, uh, actually the secretary of our board of trustees, Kim and her two sons, if you could hold them in your hearts and minds and prayers. Uh, her former husband, Benjamin Chappelle, uh, passed after a long decline. And um, thank goodness her sons were able to come back and, and join with her. And she could help her sons in figuring out what to do. Um, a stone of care. Uh, for everyone in our beloved community with all that we might not even know is going on in your life. But you know what I realized is I wanted to start a tradition of the first Sunday that we were back together in a month 
that we were going to sing happy birthday to all the people born in that month. Martin Luther King was a January baby, and I wonder, could you raise your hand if you're a January baby? I got one. My 13-year-old is a January, or now he's 14, a January baby. For all of you, Eli, could you lead us in singing happy birthday? <laughs> a stone for about 10 of you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Everybody in January and all of you on Zoom, happy birthday to you. Yes. Yay, January babies are New Year babies. Yes. On that note, <laughs> I will invite you in silence to come and you may also plant some stones and may the power in your heart and intention travel as light in, in faraway stars. Let us take another moment and bask in the stillness, bask in this quiet together, a rare moment. Back to our heart, may we hold all those things spoken and unspoken, joys, sorrows, celebrations, complex truth, hold them in our hearts and be still for just a moment. Um, we're going to sing what you may know as hymn number 95, um, but I should like to point that um, if you have any interest in joining us in this choir, low commitment. We meet every Thursday evening from 7 to 8.30, and then roughly perform once a month. So if you want to chat choir, just let me know. Also with this uh, with this song, um, we have a featured soloist, Georgine Wood. Thank you. 
As always, thank you, choir. And Eli. <laughs> and Alan. <clears throat> the reading that I'm about to do is from doc the hand of Dr. Martin Luther King. It's a sermon that he gave. Um, it's called Unfulfilled Dreams, and it was written and spoken in March 3rd of 1968 at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. So many of our forebears used to sing about freedom, and they dreamed of the day that they would be able to get out of the bosom of slavery and the long night of injustice. And they used to sing little songs. Nobody knows the trouble I seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. They thought about a better day as they dreamed their dream. And they would say, I'm so glad, glad the trouble don't last always. By and by, by and by, I'm going to lay down my heavy load. And they used to sing it because of the powerful dream. But so many died without having the dream fulfilled. And each of you this morning, in some way, is building some kind of temple. Uh, the struggle is always there. It gets discouraging sometimes. It gets disenchanting sometimes. And some of us are trying to build a, pe a temple of peace. And so often, as you set out to build um, a temple of peace, you are left lonesome. You are left discouraged. And you are left bewildered. Well, that is the story of life. And the thing that makes me happy is that I can hear a voice cr crying through the vista of time saying, it may not come today, or it may not come tomorrow, but it is well that is within the heart. It's well that you are trying. You may not see it. The dream may not be fulfilled, but it's just as good that you have a desire to bring it into reality. It's well that it's in thine heart. Thank God this morning that we do have hearts to put something meaningful in. Unfulfilled dreams. Um, as I imagine is true for many of you, as I mentioned before, the weekend of remembering Dark, uh, Dr. King can be very sad. Um, when I think of Dr. King, I am seven and a half years old again, and I remember just days, maybe when Nina Simone's bassist was writing that song, I remember the first Life magazine, remember Life magazine for those of you who are my age or older, yes? Those beautiful black and white photographs, sometimes color, um, that came in Life magazine. And I remember right after Martin Luther King died, those two pictures, the one right before he was shot, and the one, and Jesse Jackson's there smiling and holding on to his arm, and the one right after he was shot with everyone pointing at the shooter. And I remember as a seven and a half year old taking that magazine and just paging it back and forth. And you know in that magic you do in your head, your seven and a half year old head, I imagine that, okay, the clock stopped. You know, maybe if I think really hard, time stopped right before he was shot. And maybe we can all have that collective power. Maybe, maybe it stopped and maybe he'll go ahead and live, right? to be 94 and to see his four children or three or four children grow to be adults, right? And then, uh, and I think about that because it was a very consistent thing in my childhood, in my home, in my Unitarian Universalist church, in my school, in my northern community of Minnesota, 
I thought for everybody he was a hero and I couldn't imagine it. It was the first important person in my life who had died but he had, in such a violent way. I see my, my adult self in my mind. I think of so many Martin Luther King days when I'm listening to the public radio, right, as I'm driving, and oftentimes, as they do, over and over again, you hear that beautiful voice from Dr. King come out at the radio. And oftentimes, I have to pull to the side to the curb and just cry um, because of the grief I still feel. I see in my mind on this day, uh, it wasn't on Martin Luther King Day, but uh, there was a summer trip where John and I took the boys from North Carolina to Minnesota, where we have family, and uh, mainly to do roller coasters and, and, and things, uh, really death-defying rides for my husband, but <laughs> to see the country. And we went to the site that I had seen in black and white, in living color, the motel that has a museum dedicated to King. And there, with cars, of the same era, that little motel. I think it might be pink and green for all I know. I think it might be um, preserved so well. And there it was in color, this nightmare I remember from my, my childhood. And I couldn't hear my kids talking, my husband talking. I, I was just frozen and I'd look at the balcony and I'd look back at the window where the shooter had been and I imagine in my adult mind, if only I had magic and we could have stopped the clock and, uh, and seen what might have been. I see my adult self um, living and serving a congregation in Canada, um, watching the protests after George Floyd was killed. Killed not far from where I lived right after college, watching the fire and where the protesters were watching the fire at the police station across from the target where I would go with my mom to get uh, clothes for school every fall. And I wondered as I'm standing there so far away not being able to participate, how it could be like this so many years later after all the work my parents were really heroes for me too and the work they had done in civil rights um, all the good work that had been done specifically in Minnesota to fight against racism and to bring in immigrants and make a better world for so many immigrants. All of that going up in flames, it felt. That sinking feeling that we were right back at the beginning again when Martin Luther King had started his work and the people even before him and after him, um, all going up in flames. As my friend and colleague uh, Audette had said in that reading from Chris, uh, or, or when, we, when Chris was lighting the chalice, racism and discrimination, a discrimination continue to lurk like a viper and have not gone away. And it's even on the rise against Muslims and Jews and uh, BIPOC people, LGBTQ people, it's on the rise. Why is that so? It is haunting to consider that the words and wisdom Dr. King spoke to us over half a century ago, uh, in, right around his death. Now in this day, uh, it um, could still ring true. Um, he did what they, he did have a relationship with UUs, and I wanted to highlight what he had to say to us then, which again, rings so true today. He uh, would speak to you, use, he knew some, he worked alongside some in the struggle for justice. In 1966, just a year before, or two years before his death, he gave the Ware Lecture at the, Uni uh, at the Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly. And every year since the 20s, just about, we've had a wear lecture. And there will be another one in Pittsburgh, so we all can go this year at General Assembly, a wear lecture. 
And it usually features um, anyone from scientists, folk singers, uh, political activists, humanitarians, poets. 1966, the man of the hour, Martin Luther King. Um, I just love that before he gave his lecture, his little introduction that he shared, he talked about his connections to Unitarian Universalism. These are his words. There are those wonderful moments in life when you speak before a group that is so near and dear to you that you don't feel like you have to engage in the art of persuasion. He knew he was preaching to the choir, right? You don't feel like you are in the midst of strangers. You know that you are with friends. I can assure you that I feel that way tonight. Isn't that cool? That's what he was saying to us. And then he recounted that when he attended um, Boston University, he would visit our Arlington Street Church by the park there and named three UU ministers who visited and encouraged him during uh, bus uh, boycotts in Montgomery, Alabama. And he named Dr. Homer Jack, who was with Dr. King um, in Montgomery, Ghana, West Africa, Washington, D.C., and together in the world peace effort and protests in Selma. He noted the UU Commission then on religion and race and the death of Dr., uh, well, the death of Reverend James Reeb. And some of you may be familiar with that name, James Reeb. And if not, I just want to pause and, and share a little bit about his significance, uh, a UU minister. Uh, there is an amazing podca podcast series called White Lies that looked into how uh, James Reeb died in the cause, how his murderers got away with it, and some reckoning. So look up, Google White Lies, and it's an amazing listen. Um, Reverend Reeb was among 40 Unitarian Universalist ministers who answered a call from Dr. King in the spring of 1965 uh, he specifically asked rel religious leaders to join him in Selma after the violent confrontation there with police. 400 religious leaders joined him, 2,000 African Americans and others as well. And again, they marched over the bridge. That night, uh, Reverend Reeb and Clark Olson, three ministers, had uh, been to dinner, and as they left the restaurant, they were attacked by a group of white men and beaten. Um, at 38 years old, a father of four, Reverend Reeb died two days later from a serious head injury and his other injuries. And his death provoked mourning throughout the U.S. and tens of thousands held vigils in his honor and it was kind of a mixed thing that it took <clears throat> the death of a white man. For President Lyndon B. Johnson, in just a few days later, invoking Reeb's memory, he delivered a draft of the Voting Rights Act uh, to Congress to end racial discrimination in voting in the states. And by August, it had been enacted, and he signed it. And more recently, the Supreme Court gutted some of it. Um, so anyway. But it was all started uh, before then, but it really was the tipping point when Reeb was killed. Um, Dr. King actually spoke and eulogized Reverend Reeb um, at his memorial. At the Ware Lecture, as I mentioned, Dr. King acknowledged his UU friends and our denomination in our good works. But when he spoke at this assembly, the title of his talk, was don't sleep through the revolution. So yeah, he said in part, he said, I'm sure that each of you has read that arresting little story from the pen of Washington Irving entitled Rip Van Winkle. One thing that we usually don't remember about the story of Rip Van Winkle is that he slept 20 years. 
And there is um, a point about that, which is often overlooked. It is the sign on the inn in, uh, uh, of the little town from which Rip went up the mountains for his long sleep. When he went up, the sign had a picture of King George III. And when he woke up, the sign had a picture of George Washington. He had slept through the revolution. When he looked, Rip Van Winkle, at the picture of George Washington, he was amazed. He was completely lost. He knew not who he was. This incident reveals to us that the most striking thing about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not merely that he slept 20 years, but that he slept through a, a revolution when he was peacefully sleeping and snoring up the mountains. A revolution was taking place in the world that would alter the face of human history. Yet Rip knew nothing about it. He was asleep. One of the great misfortunes of history, says Dr. King, is that all too many individuals and institutions find themselves in a great period of change and yet fail to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the new situation demands. There is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. And there can be no gainsaying of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our world today. We see it in other, uh, re uh, other nations in the demise of co uh, colonialism. We see it in our own nation in the struggle against racial segregation and discrimination. And as we notice this struggle, we are aware of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our midst. Sound like 2023. <laughs> I think there's a rise in totalitarianism. Is there something else going on? Maybe a change that we might respond to. The great question he, he asks, is what do we do when we find ourselves in such a period? Certainly the church has a great responsibility because when the church is true to its nature, it stands as a moral guardian to the community and the society. It has always been the role of church, even though we don't think of it this way, what he says, it's always the role of the church to broaden horizons to challenge the status quo, and to question and break mores if necessary. If we go way back when to Jesus, maybe we remember that that was what the church was supposed to do. And then something happened to it, I guess, something happened. I'm sure that we all agree that the church has a major role to play in this period of social change. I would like to suggest that some of the things that the church must continually do in order to remain awake through this revolution. So he numbers a few things. First, we are challenged to instill within the people of our congregations a world perspective. We must live together as brothers or we all will perish together as fools. Secondly, it is necessary for the church to reaffirm over and over again the essential immorality of racial segregation. So over and over again, we must make it clear that we are through with this unjust system now, henceforth and forevermore. There is another thing that the church must do to remain awake. We must get rid of the notion once and for all that there are superior and inferior races. It is out of this notion that the whole doctrine of white supremacy came into being. And the church must take a stand through religious education <clears throat> and other channels to direct the popular mind at this point. For there are some people who still believe this strange doctrine. Yes, there are still some people who believe this strange doctrine that has made for a great deal of strife and suffering. The next thing that the church must do to remain awake through this revolution is to move out into the arena of social action. 
It is not enough for the church to work in the ideological realm and to clear up misguided ideas to remain awake through the social revolution. The church must engage in strong action programs to get rid of the last vestiges of segregation and discrimination. We must realize the plant of freedom is only a bud and not yet a flower. Only a bud and not yet a flower still today. Uh, when he talks about the role of the church and um, this vestige of racism, as you know, I've been active within Power Interfaith, a statewide network, and it's rather active locally. I was speaking with one of the ministers locally who said, I can preach all I want, but the church down the street is literally preaching white supremacy and tying it to the Bible. So the work is still here, yes? In the end, Dr. King concluded, I believe firmly that we can solve this problem. I know that there are still difficult days ahead, and they are days of glorious opportunity. We shall overcome because no lie can live forever. May it be so, right, that no lie can live forever. Are there a few lies we hear in the public forum? They, it, there can be hope. They don't live forever. Um, so it's interesting. He's saying this to white progressives, right, of his time. He's saying it to the people who fought next to him and came and joined him in every protest. We lost a few, not just Reverend Reed, but others in this fight for justice. Yet he was speaking to us about not sleeping through the revolution. If you go back to his letter to Birmingham, you can read more about what he has to say to the white moderate. He says, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devo devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, right? Or like John Lewis says, good trouble, right? We got to do some good trouble. Um, I, I Google letter to Birmingham if you haven't read it for a while. Because then you know what he's saying. We're sleeping at the wheel. We're sleeping during the revolution. If we say, we already did that work. We did that work. It's time for the others to pick up the mantle. We're all wearing the mantle. He continues, I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that flow of social progress. So in the system of white supremacy, any one of us can be the dam in that dangerously structured dam that blocks the flow of social progress. We cannot rest on the laurels of the past Social obstacles continue still. Inequities and victi victimization continue. And we are in this great period of change and may not see what the current situation demands. Are we sleeping and we don't even know it? Or we know it but are choosing a negative peace rather than engaging in the work of justice? A familiar quote of Dr. King is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If we see injustice anywhere, it's almost like how can we bear not to work against it and make sure the good work is done. Until the playing field is level in education, housing, the work environment, health care, the justice system, the work isn't done. The struggle continues, and may we continue to be vigilant. I know many of us are, and many of us do what we can. And he says, you know, keep that intention in your heart. That is well, but he does like action. 
He did like action. Dr. King's words from the World House chapter of his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, published in 1967. From time immemorial, men have lived by the principle that self-preservation is the first law of life. But this is a false assumption. I would say that other preservation is the first law of life. It is the first law of life precisely because we cannot preserve self without being concerned about preserving other selves. And it makes me think of what we say every Sunday from the indigenous, all are relation. Or the African proverb, I am because we are. In Martin Luther King's uh, last Christmas sermon, it really b boils down to this that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Many of us are aware that it seemed like Dr. King knew that he was going to die soon, that he had a sense that his, his days were numbered. A couple months before he was killed, he spoke of how he wished to be remembered. So I'll, I'll leave it there, how he wished we would remember him. He said, every now and then, I guess we all think realistically about that day when we will be victimized with what is life's final common denominator. That's something that we call death. We think about it, and every now and then I think about my own death, and I think about my own funeral. And I don't think of it in a morbid sense. And every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I would want said? And I leave the word to you this morning. If you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four other hundreds of awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I tried in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. I think we can all agree that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. will be remembered by most of us in this way. May we continue to honor his legacy and in our work for justice and peace and respect and compassion for all. May we be drum majors for the worth and dignity of everyone and every being. May we continue to carry the torch and as he would wish, let us sing them. Uh, let us sing Guide My Feet, number 348, in the Gray Hymnal.
Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Last verse, ready? Search my heart while I run this race. Search my heart while I run this race. Search my heart while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race no more. Now is the time in our service that we encourage you to be generous. Uh, the, the plates will be passed, uh, and we will accept your offerings. Uh, those of you on Zoom, you may certainly go to our website and make a donation online. A portion of the offering this month uh, will be with Patients Are Waiting, which is an organization with three main goals. One, to increase the pipeline of minority clinicians. Two, to eliminate the health disparities. And number three, to support minor minority clinicians in their practice. However, before we pass the plate, let us read in unison the affirmation of faith found in the front of your hymnal. And I think it will also appear in Zoom. And we will again be reading it first in English and second in Spanish. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth of love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia, y el servicio es su ofrenda, Este es el maestro para un acto, el convivir unido a nosotros, el buscar la verdad y el amor, y el perdonarnos unos a los otros. And now the plates will be passed. Um, while they are being passed, I'm going to make some announcements. Luckily, only three. <laughs> so, number one, there has been much discussion about the historical figures commemorating in our stained glass windows. So, next Sunday, following the service, our Faith Development Director, Lenore, will offer an hour-long workshop 
drawing on the experiences of the movement for truth-telling and memorialization. We'll see some complex truths, approach artists, faith communities, and towns that have taken uh, to reckon with the past in a more inclusive future. Number two, if you would like to learn more about Unitarian Universalism and are thinking of becoming a member, uh, or you're a, a new member and you would just like a little more support, we are getting ready to offer Starting Point, which is a three session curriculum and it will be led by Reverend Pat. And the way to sign up, however, is to email Lenore at Lenore uh, at UUCLonline.org. If you are interested, and I hope you are. I've taken refresher courses too. It's amazing what I forget. So after the plates uh, have been passed, which has been done, we are grateful to receive these generous gifts, freely given, and uh, dedicate them to the work and aspirations of this conversation. It is now time for us to read our covenant together, which is found in your order of service on the backside and in Zoom chat. We covenant to provide a welcoming community for all ages respecting diversity and the inherent worth and dignity of all. Trusting good intentions, we strive to live courageously in love, service, and spiritual growth, and to work for peace and justice in the world.